the current credit scoring system, as it stands, is flawed. And this error of being fundamentally misaligned has huge ramifications across the system for millions of Americans. There's no doubt about this. Visa is dominant. We're not necessarily talking about the affluent, urban professionals that are more likely to gravitate to, let's say, an Amex card or a Chase card. Discover really is kind of for the masses. There's no reason to think that American Express won't have a strong customer base after the next recession. $6.7 trillion. That is how much Americans spent using their debit or credit cards in 2019. More than 60% of those purchases were made using cards from Visa, a company that has long dominated the payment card industry. Not only are the majority of all payment card transactions in the United States on Visa cards, but there's been lots of litigation over time, including from the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice has had very clear legal decisions that show Visa has, quote, market power, which is the legal term, as a matter of law. So there's no doubt about this. Visa is dominant. As payment cards become more essential in our daily lives, Visa has quickly grown to become one of the most valuable companies in America. As of October 2021, Visa was valued at over $480 billion, and reported net revenue of $21.8 billion for 2020. Shares of the company have also seen an over 170% gain in the past five years. A really good way to think about Visa's revenue stream is for every $100 spent on a Visa card anywhere in the world, they make about a quarter, about, meaning 25 cents, <laughs> an actual quarter. Every time you buy a pair of shoes, that's $100, they get 25 cents of that. As the network has scaled, that's very high incremental margins, and so the profitability of the business naturally goes up. But Visa's success hasn't always been great news for merchants who have no choice but to rely on them for payment. If I could ask Visa for one thing, it would be for relief in the swipe fee arena. We are paying way too much, you're making way too much money off of us, and you know the lack of competition that you have with all of your issuing banks charging the same swipe fees across all markets across the country, it's really unfair. We don't do business that way. Uh, other industries don't do business that way. So I don't know how you can get away with it. So how exactly does Visa make money? And why does it dominate the payment card industry? The Bank of America launched Visa as the nation's first licensed credit card for middle-class consumers and small to medium-sized merchants in 1958. The computer is changing our world, the way we do business. By 1970, Bank of America gave up its direct control over the card, passing the control to a group of issuer banks that continued to manage, promote, and develop the new network in the United States. The company grew quickly after, expanding internationally by 1974 and introducing its first debit card in 1975. Every month, British shoppers sign for one and a half billion pounds worth of goods on a credit card. In 2007, Visa completed its corporate restructuring with the formation of Visa Inc. and went public in 2008, raising $17.9 billion in one of the largest U.S. public offerings to date. Visa was set up to be dominant. They started actually as an association of thousands of banks across the country. So all these banks came together and established Visa to have this national credit card. But of course they had a dominant position because it was virtually all the banks. There are still class B shares of Visa stock, which are actually owned still by those original banks. Today, Visa has grown to become one of the world's largest payment processing networks, saying it has over 3.4 billion cards in the market across over 200 countries and territories. Visa generated over $4 trillion in purchase volume in the United States, according to the February 2021 Nielsen Report. In comparison, MasterCard has over 2.3 billion cards in the market with a purchase volume of roughly 1.7 trillion. 
Visa does have a huge number of cards out there, more than MasterCard without question. Discover Card's a little bit anomalous. They have more cards than they have transactions, but Visa cards in both credit and debit are the most frequent ones, and Visa dominates the transaction counts in both markets. And it's a profitable business. Since going public, Visa has rarely had a decline in revenue, and its shares have continued to outperform the S&P 500, excluding just three years. And although the year isn't over yet, 2021 is on track to see Visa underperform the S&P 500. In one of those years, 2020, Visa still reported net revenue of $21.8 billion, with operating expenses at $7.8 billion. Its total net income for the fiscal year came to roughly $10.7 billion. Their profit margins are huge. The numbers I've seen over time have been, gosh, 30-40% profit margins, where to give you a sense in the retail industry, profit margins tend to be in the 2, 3, maybe 4% range. So as a business, the reason it's so profitable is because it's a primarily fixed cost business. It's once you've got that infrastructure all in place, each incremental transaction that's flowing through that ecosystem comes in at extremely high incremental margins because it's just this massive capacity network. And, and so as Visa has scaled, their profitability has gone up dramatically for that reason. So how exactly does Visa make money? Contrary to popular belief, Visa doesn't make any profit from credit card interest fees. Instead, those fees are charged by the card issuer, in most cases, banks, allowing Visa to face none of the risks that come with lending money. So Visa does not have direct relationships with individual consumers. The banks do, the banks issue the cards. And so you may get your card or I may get my card from Bank of America or Wells Fargo or Citibank or any number of these other banks, including local banks. But while many people think of those as Visa cards, they're really not. They're the bank's cards that happen to have Visa on them. And Visa is the network on those cards Visa's business model relies heavily on what is known as the four-party model. When you use a Visa card to make a purchase, there are usually four entities that come into play. You, the customer making the purchase, the bank that holds the customer's money, the merchant selling the product, and Visa that works as a middleman connecting all three of those entities together. They're a physical network, not dissimilar from telecom network or an internet style network. It's just telecom might carry voice, internet carries information, Visa's network carries money, right? So it's a different type of physical network that connects about 18,000 banks and other types of financial institutions globally. And every time that you use a card, a series of messages have to run back and forth between the cash register or the website or wherever you're making a purchase purchase going back to your bank that issued you the card to see whether you are who you said you are and whether you have the money right to do an authorization and then also to go back and kind of clear and settle the transaction meaning actually move the money from your bank's bank account over into the merchant's bank account. A majority of Visa's gross revenue, about 39%, comes from data processing fees that are required to complete this practice. Roughly 34% consists of service revenues, a fee that Visa charges card issuers like banks for working with Visa-branded payment methods. They charge a set of fees associated with that kind of brand network that creates the trust in the ecosystem. The trust that enables it so that, you know, you can just walk into any merchant anywhere in the world and hand them a piece of plastic. But if it says Visa on it and the merchant takes Visa, then the transaction works. And just imagine if you had a card that didn't have that on it, right? You wouldn't work. International transaction revenues take up about 22% of the company's gross revenue. Beyond the three main sources of revenue, Visa has also been continuously investing in other types of payment that could bring more sources of revenue for the company in the near future. This is like B2B payments, business to business payments. This is like disbursements. That's when a business pays, a, um, think of like an Uber driver or Lyft driver or an insurance payout, things like that. There's a lot of person to person payments to people, to individuals exchanging money. 
if you're really taking a long-term view of visa, like five, 10, 20 years, increasingly other forms of payment are going to be an increasing part of their business. Visa's success in the payment processing industry has also led to a series of legal cases and investigations over the years. The Department of Justice has sued Visa multiple times, has entered into consent decrees over everything from, you know, Visa used to have rules that said any bank that issued their cards could not issue any cards from Discover or American Express, and that was found to be an antitrust problem. Visa had rules tying together credit cards and debit cards so that merchants, if you wanted to accept a credit card, had to accept a debit card and vice versa. Almost, it's hard to think of other industries that have had more antitrust litigation than this one. In December 2019, Visa and MasterCard agreed to pay $5.5 billion to settle against merchants who had accused them of charging excessive fees. The largest ever class action settlement of an antitrust case, according to the co-lead counsel of the case, Berger Montague. Visa also notably abandoned its $5.3 billion takeover of Plaid. So Visa and Plaid are terminating their $5 billion merger. After the Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit on the grounds that it would limit competition in the payment industry. Most recently, in August 2021, a federal judge certified a class action lawsuit accusing Visa and MasterCard for charging excessive ATM fees to consumers and operators. Visa declined to comment on the matter. Meanwhile, retailers argue that the swipe fees incurred by Visa are simply too high for smaller businesses to survive. I don't think the average consumer thinks about swipe fees when they're using their credit or debit card. Business owners certainly do, because for me, swipe fees is the second highest expense line item on my P&L, right after, right after labor, I mean, right after our, our payroll expense, ahead of rent. In 2009, swipe fees collected by Visa and MasterCard sat at $25.6 billion. A decade later, it more than doubled to $67.6 billion in 2019, according to the National Retail Federation. The overall processing fees paid by U.S. merchants to accept all card payments totaled $110 billion in 2020. It tends to be somewhere in the range of 10% of what merchants pay on a transaction. I know a lot of business owners and it saddens me because so many people have come to accept it as it is what it is. And I'm like, no, I mean, these, these, these prices are so ridiculous. The amount we pay in swipe fees is so high that we have to do something about it. Somebody has to do something about it. This is a central part of the problem with their dominance is that this is the banks acting collectively and setting prices where they should be competing on price like all other American businesses do. Meanwhile, those in support argue that Visa stands on the side of merchants rather than the banks. The Visa's business structure is very balanced and if anything is actually skewed, believe it or not, toward the merchants. They actually get the majority of their revenue from the banks and the ecosystem that's supporting the merchants. So they really are pretty agnostic in the ecosystem. Like they are there to serve as this central party that facilitates effective digital payments, kind of balancing both sides. What's certain is that Visa has effectively changed the world of commerce forever. Visa at some level is a victim of their own success in the sense that they're so ubiquitous and so secure and so easy to use that people begin to take it for granted. For the consumer, it's fantastic, just enabler of their of their life. I mean, I just always tell people, imagine if you didn't have it and you literally had to pay for everything, either with cash and a check, what your life would be like. On the merchant side, though, the same thing is true. I mean, cash is expensive for merchants. They have to have cash drawers. They have to have armored trucks. They have to have managerial level people that count the cash um, and make sure that there's not theft at the end of every shift. There's always, of course, debate and griping about the kind of cost of taking card payments. The reality is that the alternatives are also extremely expensive and it's a very quick, easy, especially with like contactless payments nowadays where you can just tap it and go like it speeds up your checkout lines, just facilitates the whole world of commerce. $52.9 billion. 
That's the total revenues net of interest expense Amex made in 2022. But despite its impressive earnings, Amex is far from dominating the credit card industry. Its domestic payment volume is far behind that of Visa and MasterCard, and it lags behind Discover based on the number of cards in circulation. It's a difficult business for American Express to be in, given the threats posed by Visa and MasterCard. What they've leaned into are people who use the card a lot, spend a lot of money, and pay it off. And they're willing to cater to that crowd by giving them premium perks, whether that's at the airport or things they can use every day, you know, whether that's a Walmart Plus membership or Uber Cash or things that keep you using that card, keep it at the top of your wallet. Armed with impressive rewards and a loyal customer base, Amex has achieved impressive growth. The company's revenue has increased over 32% since 2017, and shares of the company have shown resilience and growth in a tumultuous market. Amex, I would think of them as a bit more of a, what we call a quality compounder, like a very steady, stable business, growing revenues, high single digit to 10%, and then they get a little bit of operating leverage on top of that, they grow earnings like in the low double digits. They've learned a lot through COVID. They've diversified their business model. They've sharpened their pencils on what matters to their customers, and it's really showing, and they're coming back strong. So what is the secret to Amex's success, and where is it headed next? American Express began as a freight forwarding company in 1850, transporting various goods across a rapidly expanding nation. It wasn't until the late 19th century that it began its transformation into a payments company. It began to introduce financial products and travel services. Then, in the 1950s, Following its high success from traveler checks, it introduced its first charge card to offer customers a more convenient way to pay. Where the brand truly begins as we know it today, in my opinion. And you know, they've had multiple products come out, the gold card, the platinum card, and really focusing on the consumer and the corporate card business. What sets Amex apart from the rest of the industry is the way in which their network operates. Most credit cards from companies like Visa and MasterCard function in what's called an open loop system. When a cardholder uses the card in their network to make a purchase from a merchant, they generate revenue by relaying that information from the issuers, usually the banks that have issued the cards, to the acquirers or the merchant's bank. Amex, on the other hand, operates in a closed loop system where it functions as the issuer, the acquirer, and the network combined. Amex is different from Visa and MasterCard because Amex is a lender. Visa and MasterCard are merely card networks. So they process transactions, but they're not actually issuing credit. American Express is both. They are a lender of credit and also a card network, a processor of transactions. That really enables them to see exactly what their customers are spending down to the item and have all that extra data where they can then advertise or target different reward spends across that, that's going to be very different than what Visa and MasterCard can see, which would be just really total dollar amounts. It allows them to tailor some of those deals, um, especially on the merchant side. If there's a reason why they want a specific merchant's business, they can change their normal terms in order to fit that situation. They don't have to worry about a bank being upset about what those terms are, whereas Visa and MasterCard would. This closed loop system also allows Amex to earn money from interest, unlike Visa and MasterCard. The company generated about $9.9 .9 billion in net interest income in 2022. It's advantageous to be diversified. So they get paid anytime a transaction is processed. And then there are also other levers like people who pay annual fees or carry debt or other things that incur charges. But interest income is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Amex's total revenue. Discount revenues or fees charged to merchants that accept its cards brought in more than $30 billion in 2022 contributing to more than 58% of Amex's total revenue net of interest expense for that year. They charge a premium to their merchants to take their cards, and the merchants are willing to pay that premium 
because American Express is bringing them the most affluent, biggest spenders. They make the discount revenue off of the swiping. And so they charge the merchants a certain discount rate, two and a half or so, it depends. This can vary by merchant size, actually. But a lot of their revenue, unlike their competitors, is coming from this swipe fee versus net interest income. Because of its reliance on discount fees, big spenders are Amex's most important asset. Recent reports claim that Amex card members spend on average three times as much annually as those who aren't members. Amex targets these affluent cardholders through a spend-centric model that focuses on generating revenues primarily by driving spending on its cards. That's where rewards come in. In just 2022, Amex spent almost $17 billion providing services and rewards to its card members. When they talk about a spend-centric model, they're really talking about being your go-to card. And I think a really good example of this is the Amex Platinum card, one of their flagship premium products. On the face of it, this is a travel card, and it has a lot of travel benefits with rewards and airport lounges and all that fun stuff. But you can also get a free Walmart Plus membership, and you can get a whole bunch of other everyday kind of credits. They're trying to make this a go-to every day, not just something that you pull out a few times a year when you're traveling. That high spend-centric model is the reason why they can provide such strong rewards that they do, and why the customers are willing to pay those higher annual fees than for other cards, because they're getting the benefits of the spend and the rewards, because the people that are spending are actually making this up in their spend behavior. Having a closed loop system means how much the cardholder spends is usually more important than the number of transactions made. Amex also utilizes the immense information gathered through its closed loop system to create offers that attract and retain customers. A lot of the tricky part about rewards programs in kind of big, you know, kind of more mainstream cards is that the rewards are a little bit of like ad hoc, like they, they, they might have very cool, interesting rewards, but they might not be things that you as the consumer value. In American Express's case, because of that closed loop dynamic and because they know you and they know the merchant, they can create rewards that feel to you as the consumer, like this program was custom designed for me. Like they can go out and recruit all of the top hotels and all of the top restaurants and have specialized offers and specialized rewards and stuff to bring consumers, the affluent consumers to those hotels, to those restaurants. And everyone sees benefits from their role in the middle of connecting those dots. Having an affluent customer base also gives the bonus advantage of decreased credit risk. Delinquency rates for Amex have remained substantially lower compared to other major issuing banks. Credit losses through the cycle will move really closely with unemployment, as you would expect. If you think about the changes in unemployment, they roughly go up between 1.7 times and 2.25 times in a recession. And the prime credit card issuer will see roughly that same sort of increase in credit losses over that time frame. Whereas an American Express could actually see a little bit less than that. So if it was to go up two times, you might see American Express go up 1.8 times. And so that makes a big difference as far as the cyclicality of the business, the overall risk to earnings and returns. Um, it's, it's really one of the reasons why investors kind of focus on this stock in a downturn. It's considered a safety play, and that's why we're outperformed with the stock today. In recent years, Amex has begun to diversify its customers further, mainly targeting millennials and underbanked Americans. I really think that Amex is doing a good job winning over younger customers as well. They've talked about how about 60% of their new card acquisitions are Gen Z and millennials. And I think they've done some creative things there with experiences, whether it's travel or dining or exclusive concerts, like they did one with Jack Harlow. And, you know, they're just trying to reach a younger audience that will be the leaders and heavy spenders of tomorrow. Amex has also made meaningful investments in scaling and improving its technology allowing its offerings to be more competitive against the rise of alternative premium cards. They continue to make progress abroad. They were actually the first US-based credit card issuer to win approval in China, and they're partnering with local brands there to really tap into that increasingly affluent consumer audience. 
in Europe, this is like France, Germany, credit card adoption, both by affluent consumers and by small businesses is much lower, much lower than it is say in the US, the UK and Australia where it's quite high. And so there's a huge amount of just growth opportunity. I think increasingly there are also tech companies in a way that, you know, whether that's the apps and the web experiences that they provide or you know, all of the data that they're gathering. You know, some people say that a concept like buy now, pay later could be a big threat to the MX model. They actually were the first traditional credit card issuer to unveil their version of that. A few years ago, they came out with MX Pay It Planet, which I think again speaks to offering something for everybody. The biggest threat for Amex is the competition within the credit card industry. To me, the biggest weakness or danger for American Express really is that marketplace power of Visa and MasterCard and what they may decide to do with it, which may or may not be anything that American Express can control. The value that they are able to offer from the closed loop model is distinctive and unique. But as things like data analytics and AI get better and the whole process of issuing cards and managing card programs becomes more digitized, as their technology advances, those open loop card programs can better replicate what American Express is able to do uniquely. So they can they can run better analytics to understand your consumer spendings. So they can better tailor your rewards. But while loan loss provisions have increased following a period of high inflation, experts believe that Amex is more than ready to weather a possible recession. They're not by any means immune to a downturn, but at the same time with that high spender, affluent customer, those credit losses are likely significantly lower than some of the peers that are more focused on average consumer, even subprime borrowers. And so, you know, there's no reason to think that American Express won't have a strong customer base after the next recession. America runs on credit. The three-digit score represents how likely a person is to pay his or her bills, and it impacts almost every aspect of an American's financial life. It's like your passport into everything that you need to do as an adult. And it affects so many things, not just access to credit, so your ability to get a credit card, a mortgage, a reasonable car loan. Landlords use credit reports and credit scores, so it'll affect your ability to get an apartment. Insurance companies use them. Having a low or no credit score can have severe financial consequences. 42% of Americans said that their credit scores prevented them from accessing financial products, like credit cards or loans. Life can become more expensive and more difficult as your credit score falls. But some credit experts argue that the current credit reporting and scoring systems have major issues. The current credit scoring system, as it stands, is flawed. And this error of being fundamentally misaligned has huge ramifications across the system for millions of Americans. Others say many of these criticisms are misguided. The reality is that the credit reporting system that we have here in the United States is sort of like the crown jewel of, of the world. A lot of the criticisms are based on some fundamental misunderstanding of how credit scores are calculated and how they're used. If you take a moment to not be knee-jerk angry about financial service for a minute, then I think a reasonable person would have to conclude that these are actually good for consumers relative to a world without credit scores and what that would mean to our bottom lines. So how do credit scores work in America? And do they help or hurt consumers? A credit score usually refers to a number between 300 and 850 which represents the holder's financial stability and credit worthiness. The higher the number, the better a consumer looks to potential lenders. Credit scores in the 500s are considered to be very bad. Credit scores in the 600s, we're starting to use terms like subprime, near prime, getting close to average, but you really need to get yourself into the 700s before you actually hit the national average, which is between 710 and 720, and then start working your way into the elite level scores, which are well into the 700s and certainly 
into the 800s. Credit scores and reports are two separate things. Reports refer to statements containing information about your credit situation, while scores are calculated based on that information from the report. The credit report is like the test you took. The credit score is the grade you got on the test. One is influential over the other, but they're not the same thing. Today, scores calculated by Fair Isaac Corporation, or FICO, have become the industry standard, used by 90% of top lenders. They're calculated using five main categories, 35% from payment history, 30% from the amount owed, 15% from the length of credit history, and 10% for new credit and the types of credit you have. It's based on an analytic algorithm. So we look at actual data patterns to say what helps us predict whether you're going to pay credit in the future. One of the main benefits of having a credit score is that it provides a quick and empirically sound method of measuring credit worthiness. Americans are borrowing today more than ever, with household debt topping $16 trillion during the second quarter of 2022 making credit scores crucial to many businesses. It allows lenders to make very, very precise decisions and have a very deep understanding of the likelihood of someone paying you back. Experts say that such a streamlined process is also the reason why Americans have been able to enjoy low interest rates for so many years. The credit scoring system allows industry to quickly and cheaply make decisions about whether or not you're going to have credit. The cheaper it is for the lender to decide whether or not they're going to give you credit, in the aggregate, the lower the cost is for the lender, and hopefully that gets passed along to the consumers in a more efficient system. Without this system, lenders are going to do what lenders do, which is they're going to mitigate their risk. What that means in practical terms is higher interest rates, because that's how lenders mitigate risk. They charge everybody more to subsidize the risk that's posed by everyone, or more declinations. It's easier to say no to an applicant than to book an applicant who you know is going to default on a loan. Representing a person's credit worthiness using numbers also allegedly helped prevent lending discrimination. Lenders often relied on more subjective methods of evaluation prior to the invention of credit scores. Credit scoring when it was first developed was an advancement. It is better than having some bankers sit across from you and judge you and read the information in your credit score because they bring a lot of their subjective analysis and their own life experience into the analysis. And if their life is different than your life, frankly, if it's some white guy sitting across from some woman of color, that analysis can be flawed. If the information is not on a credit report, it is systemically impossible for your credit score to be influenced by it. What is not on your credit report? Things like your gender, your sexual orientation, your politics, your level of education, how much money you make, the socioeconomic makeup of your neighborhood, your level of education. So we're able to assess credit risk looking only at the past behavior that is on the credit report and only to the extent that it predicts future credit risk. Yet despite its good intentions, experts say that the credit scoring system still suffers from discrimination. A survey of 5,000 U.S. adults found that more than half of Black Americans reported having a low or no credit score, compared to 41% for Hispanics, 37% for whites, and 18% for Asian Americans. Credit scores are based on past performance. So you're going backwards in history to make a judgment about the future. The further we go backwards in history, the deeper the structural racism in the United States was. Intentional racism that happened decades ago gets baked into the cake, into the system, into the institutions and policies of our society. And that kind of structural racism requires no animus, no intent, but it still hurts black and brown consumers. If your parent put your name on a bill because they had bad credit and then they were delinquent, You can turn 18 and inherit derogatory information on your credit report through nothing that you did. If you're a new immigrant in this country, your prior credit history doesn't travel with you. These credit bureaus are mostly domestic, so you show up with nothing. And by the way, a blank slate is a bad place to be in credit scoring. It means that you're unscored and your information starts off low and poor. 19% of American adults have no credit history, 
or are considered unscorable by existing systems. Sadly, what the scores do is they sort of amplify those inequalities because they go in and they say, okay, you're already disadvantaged. Now you can be doubly disadvantaged because the score then sort of objectifies that you are somehow not worthy of being given a chance, that you are somehow um, deserving of much higher fines and fees than everyone else. Errors in credit reports can also often lead to miscalculated scores. A survey in 2021 found that more than a third of those polled found errors in their credit reports. Of more than 700,000 credit or consumer reporting complaints received in 2021, more than half pertain to incorrect information on their report. For me, it was a different person named Aaron Klein who didn't pay their cell phone bill in New Jersey. I also happened to live in New Jersey for graduate school, and this stuck with me for years. One in 20 have an error so serious it could cost them either the ability to get credit or a job or an apartment. However, those within the industry argue otherwise. When we look at our data, it is astronomically reliable. So we're, we're constantly auditing and evaluating our data. Our regulators are examining us on a regular, ongoing basis. So they're looking at all of our systems around data integrity, data reliability, how we engage with consumers, et cetera. Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, credit bureaus are responsible for correcting any inaccurate information on their reports. But research has suggested that many consumers find errors difficult to get fixed. Credit bureaus are like, like a judge that always rules for the defendant. So if your mortgage servicer says you're late, even though you really were never late and you have documentation that you were never late, it will still show up as late. Fixing mistakes is expensive and time consuming for the credit reporting and credit scoring industry. They are not incentivized to have accuracy, particularly if the mistakes are symmetric and even out. Our entire role in the consumer credit ecosystem is to provide reliable, accurate information. If we were unable to do that, nobody would have any interest in engaging with us whatsoever. Our position is that the system only works and we can only succeed if our data is incredibly reliable and accurate. And that means engaging with consumers continually to try to make sure that they're able to effectively managing their credit and that they're able to effectively feel as though they can interface with us about any concerns that they have. Another main concern is the lack of regulation and oversight that can ensure fairness and transparency within the industry. You know, I think the idea that the industry is unregulated is, is a fiction. And, you know, we operate in one of the most highly regulated spaces possible. You have a 50-year-old federal statute called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which essentially mandates everything having to do with credit reports from our rights to challenge information, our rights to freeze our credit reports, our rights to get copies of our credit reports. You have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which regulates credit bureaus vis-a-vis -vis credit report accuracy. You have the Federal Trade Commission that shares that regulatory responsibility. I must say that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which took over oversight of this industry about 10 years ago, They've done a really good job of trying to reform the credit bureaus, but I would go further than more regulation or even more laws. Over the years, credit reporting and scoring agencies have made several changes in response to the criticisms against the industry. Perhaps the biggest change comes from the use of alternative data to improve accuracy and inclusion. They've started trying to incorporate other quote unquote non-traditional information. For example, if you pay your mortgage on time every month, your credit score is gonna increase. But if you pay your rent on time every month, nothing happens because that information isn't reported. We've innovated with scores like the FICO score XD and the Ultra FICO score. They augment traditional credit data with rich alternative data, such as how you pay your telco utilities, as well as information that's in your checking and savings account. The point of these new scores is to allow consumers to find other ways beside the historical credit to demonstrate their ability to repay credit. More regulatory changes could also be coming. Two bills, the Protecting Your Credit Score Act and the Comprehensive Credit Act, were both passed by the House in 2020, aimed at overhauling the credit scoring system with more oversight and provisions aimed at protecting consumer credit. They have yet to be put on a vote by the Senate. 
One of the initiatives that, that we're championing, because we really think the solution to uh, a lot of these concerns around how do you help consumers access financial products uh, is an alternative data piece of legislation called the Credit Access and Inclusion Act, which would really encourage the reporting of rental data, utility data, bring new data into the system that would allow literally millions of Americans to access financial products and services. But ultimately, credit in its current state is dependent on the consumer's financial decisions. I'll tell you the two things that you need to do, in or, and, and it will be impossible for you not to have a good score. Number one, never, ever miss a payment on anything, ever. That's easy. It's writing a check at the end of the month and paying your minimum payment, right? Number two, you got to stay out of credit card debt. And I'm not saying don't use credit cards. I'm saying don't max out your credit cards. Don't use them as a supplement to your income or to keep up with the Joneses or to impress somebody. Pay your bills on time, stay out of excessive credit card debt, lather, rinse, repeat, and you're gonna have fantastic credit scores. You know, how you manage your credit is a sign of responsibility. It's not. A lot of people have negative items on their credit report because they were the victim of bad luck, not because they're bad people. So they got sick, they lost their job, and now they can't pay their bills and, and their credit report's gonna stop them from getting a new one? That's crazy. Credit cards are a trillion dollar industry. In 2018, they were swiped nearly 45 billion times, paying for products and services worth just under $4 trillion. Americans owe around $1.1 trillion in credit card debt, about $5,700 each. The U.S. consumer is doing very, very well. Strong consumer sentiment, strong retail spending, very low unemployment. All of those things are great for the credit card industry. Giants like MasterCard, Visa, and Amex dominate the network market. Chase, Citi, Amex, and Capital One are the biggest issuers. A quiet but a steady and perhaps lesser talked about competitor is Discover. We're, we're not one of those companies that's always out there talking about how great we are. The number one performing stock of all financials in the S&P for a 10-year period is not just an average company. Discover has the 10th largest credit card portfolio in the world, despite a smaller footprint outside of the U.S. Still, there are 57 million Discover cards out there. It's not really for the kind of people that want to fly first class to the Maldives. Discover really is kind of for the masses. When you think about the average consumer and likely where they borrow and, and what their FICO scores are, I think that they're right smack in the middle of all these issuers. The Discover credit cards topped the J.D. Power customer satisfaction survey in 2019. So, how did they win over the American middle class? To understand the credit card industry, it's important to know the difference between a credit card network and an issuer. The network is basically the digital rails on which transactions are processed. A card issuer is the company who actually takes on the credit risk. Discover and American Express are both an issuer and a network. That gives them some diversity in their business model. It also gives them a really stable source of revenue, at least from the processing side. Very different from the credit side of the equation where that could be a lot more profitable if they're charging you 18, 20, 25% interest, but there's also risk there. And it's also less predictable in terms of the transactors and the revolvers. You know, people who are paying their bills in full or people who carry debt from month to month. 40% of Americans are transactors. 60% carry debt from month to month. We spoke with Discover CEO Roger Hochschild over the phone. Our model is lend focused. We're looking for people, and we make most of our money from people who borrow money. Uh, American Express's model is much more spend focused. For issuers, American Express and JP Morgan interchange the top two slots on outstanding debt. Citibank, Bank of America, and Capital One fill up slots three to five. Discover is sixth. The Discover credit card was launched in 1986 by Sears Roebuck, the largest retailer at the time. 
Back then, it was part of Dean Witter, which was part of Sears. And they launched during Super Bowl 20. They had this commercial uh, back in early 1986. They talked about the dawn of Discover, and they really pioneered two main categories, cash back and no annual fee. Sears wanted to expand into financial services and decided to accept only this year's Discover card at its stores. Many merchants actually viewed them as a threat, and they thought that accepting a Discover card meant they were helping their rival Sears. So that actually really led to a lot of hesitation and, and difficulty for Discover establishing itself. In 1993, Dean Witter Discover & Company became a publicly traded company when it spun off from Sears. Sears eventually filed for bankruptcy in 2018, but that's another story. In 1997, Dean Witter Discovering Company merged with Morgan Stanley. The mid-2000s were eventful for Discover, and the barrier to entry didn't end at Sears' front door. MasterCard and Visa were established in the industry, and Discover wanted in. In 2004, the Supreme Court upheld a ruling in Discover's favor. Discover claimed that MasterCard and Visa had harmed its business by preventing their member banks from issuing credit cards from the Discover network. They did everything they could, including reaching out to merchants to tell them that taking Discover would help Sears. After the Supreme Court ruling, Discover's business started taking off. G, Consumer Finance, Walmart, and Sam's Club became card clients, and Pulse, a debit card network, was acquired. With more than 50 million cardholders, the company had become a major player. In July 2007, only six months before the Great Recession, Discover severed ties with Morgan Stanley and started trading on the New York Stock Exchange as DFS. We just set up our, our finance department, our treasury function. Luckily, we had a heritage that goes all the way back to years of being conservative lenders. In the midst of the downturn, the company received welcoming news. Visa and MasterCard paid Discover nearly $3 billion in damages after finally settling the lawsuit. Discover's strategy remained simple. Charge no annual fee, offer simple rewards like cashback, conduct all business online, 24-7 US-based customer service, and acquire and keep the customers who will revolve a balance every month. There's a relentless focus here at Discover on a limited set of businesses. You compare us to most other banks that are big in credit cards, they've got commercial real estate, they have small business lending. We're focused on consumers. That consumer is a prime borrower. 81% of Discover's customers have a FICO score of 660 and above. Competitors like American Express caters to a more affluent customer base with a higher average FICO score. In Capital One, serves a larger number of subprime borrowers than Discover. We might be more like Toyota, and American Express may be more like Mercedes. I would say the typical Discover customer is probably a little bit more likely to be middle class or even lower middle class, maybe more likely to be a parent, maybe more likely to live in middle America. You know, we're not necessarily talking about the affluent urban professionals that are more likely to gravitate to, let's say, an Amex card or a Chase card. According to the J.D. Power Customer Satisfaction Survey, Discover has been voted number one every year since 2014, except for in 2017. It's very difficult in this stage of the game in the United States in a very mature market to grow your business because so many people already have a card. But it's doing a really, really good job of keeping the customers it has very satisfied with the, with the value proposition that it's offering. I think sometimes these airline mile cards get a lot more attention because that's just a sexier kind of redemption, right? It's you know, first class, airport lounge, all that fancy stuff. The fact is though, we found that about two thirds of credit card rewards chasers prefer cash back. Discover's balance sheet reflects the company's improving finances since the 2008 recession. The investors that are here are looking for, you know, high capital return, I and mean, they've been roughly around that 70% plus uh, payout to investors through dividend and share repurchases. And so it's about having a high ROTCE, having a very, you know, stable but growing uh, business model. Maybe it's the Midwest heritage, we're, we're not one of those companies that's always out there talking about how great we are. 
and there are others who do much more of that. But the last few years haven't stacked up for the Discover stock. In a one-year and a five-year comparison, it underperformed that of the S&P 500 and multiple competitors. On January 24, 2020, a day after the company's earnings call, the stock fell by 11%, the most it had done in 10 years. It was announced that their share of high-risk customers, something called troubled debt restructurings, increased by nearly 50%, something that has worried investors. In an email to CNBC, the Discover CEO, Roger Hochschild, said, the market and individual stock prices can be volatile from time to time. Our focus is on continuing to build the long-term value of the Discover franchise, which we believe will be reflected in the stock's valuation over time. Data show that younger generations aren't as enthused about credit cards, and though people as a whole spend more and more on credit cards, revolving debt has declined nearly every year in the past two decades potentially hurting companies like Discover, who depend on finance charges. If you want to continue to talk to your shareholders and, and give them a successful story, you're going to have to come up with something that's going to look better than just steady as it goes. It would not be surprising if in time we see Discover either making an acquisition, an acquisition through merger uh, with another credit card issuer or being acquired by somebody bigger. In this day and age, it's hard to know what's going to happen, but I would say we have a complete business model. We're strong on both sides of the balance sheet, if you think about our lending products, but also our deposit products. So I feel very good about how Discover is positioned.